Hey, Mike, uh, thanks again for joining me for our Thought Leader Spotlight Series. Uh, again, I'm your host, Matt Camp, head of partnerships for Deal Machine. Um, on these, we really like to try to shine a spotlight on industry experts, on thought leaders like yourself, to really hear inspiring stories, educate our audience on lessons that they've learned, and really you know, see through their eyes how they see the world evolving. So uh, again, today we have Mike Simmons. Um, we're excited to have him on today is it, you know, with Mike being a real estate investor, a podcast host, a, a speaker, an author of the book level jumping, um, you know, where, where he shares, you know, principles in that book that allowed him to take his business virtually from, from nothing to a million in, in about a year. Um, so Mike has mentored hundreds of entrepreneurs. He's helped them grow their business. And in addition to that, he's shared uh, the stage with such an impressive list of, of other, other speakers like Gary V, um, Ryan Seahart, or Seahant, uh, Jocko Wilnick, um, Russell Brunson, and many, many more. So uh, Mike, thank you so much again for jumping on here. Yeah. Um, to begin with today, I know uh, we talked a few things around like execution and how to surround yourself with great people, how to scale up. So, you know, we'll try to cover things that both newbies and people that are maybe doing a few deals a month and are looking to scale um, will both find valuable. But um, again, thanks. Thanks for uh, being on. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is uh, going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And, and to begin with, I mean, I, I love your your background and your story and the why behind what you're doing with, with real estate. So maybe can you start there a little bit more? Uh, I know I gave that, that brief bio, but I'd love to hear your story too. Yeah, for sure. And I think this is, I think this is something that a lot of folks that I've talked to struggle with, you know, getting out of the starting blocks a little bit. And, and for me, I, you know, it's sort of embarrassing and I really didn't start talking about this until just this past year. But for me, I, I knew that I wanted to invest in real estate. Like I kind of made this decision in my head. Like, I think this is really what I want to do. I'm excited about it in 2003. And, and I bought my first house to flip in 2008, right? So you go, well, hey, Mr. Just Start, like why in the world did, it, did you decide something in 2003 and you didn't execute until 2008? And it's because all of the things in our head that we have as human beings that cause us to hit that pause button or hit the brakes a little bit. And, and the things that I worked with and dealt with and some of the things that I know a lot of people deal with is I'm afraid to tell my spouse because I don't know that he or she will see my vision. I don't know that they will believe I can do it. And so they don't wanna have some of these difficult conversations with their loved ones. And maybe it's their parents if they're young enough, like they don't wanna tell their parents. Like mm -hmm. I was, by the time that I taught, had a conversation with my parents about what I was gonna do and like I was gonna quit my corporate job, like I was 40 and I still was had anxiety a little bit about telling them because you know, Midwest union kind of automotive industry born and raised like they, there's nobody in my life that did or would wanted to do what I was doing. And so I knew out of love, they're going to discourage it. They just will. And, and I waited to tell them until I was kind of like successful, right? I wasn't like killing it, but I was, I was, I had a lot of traction. I was making as much in my part-time side gig of flipping houses as I was in my full-time job. And so I knew the only thing holding me back from taking this thing to the next level was that I was eight hours a day. I was busy at, at a job, right? So I made that decision to leave. And, and, and I think the reason why people struggle with this conversation with their spouse or with their parents or with their you know, friends or whatever is because they don't necessarily believe it themselves. They haven't worked it out in their own head, like what their game plan is. They don't have an escape plan, so to speak, right? So they don't tell anybody or maybe they don't even get started right away because they just don't know how to present this to the people that matter to them in their life in a way that won't crush them or discourage them. And so it took me a long time and I had other things going on. I was, I was going through a divorce and, and, and I was actually had gone back to college during this time when I decided I wanted to do this. And so I was working on that. And, and, and these are all excuses. Trust me, you, you can get started in business. I don't care what you have going on. I don't care who the president is. I don't care what flavor of pandemic we're dealing with at the time. Like it's always a good time to get started. But I allowed some of the self-doubt and fear and the fact that I wasn't sure how to discuss it with the people in my life. And I, I let all of those things stop. me. And so it wasn't until I really just decided I had had enough and I had kind of gotten sick of my fear-based procrastination. Really, I'm a procrastinator by nature. I am. I feel like I do a lot. I get a lot done. 
but I, I fight procrastination and I allowed fear to be the excuse why I didn't do something. And it wasn't until I got so fed up, like, listen, I, I've talked about this before, but I was raised by a Marine and not just any Marine like this, you know, he, he was, he was in active combat. He volunteered to go to active combat. Like he is, he's a no nonsense, no excuse kind of a guy. And when I was growing up, fear was not really tolerated. And so when I feel myself being afraid and letting that kind of affect me, I sort of hear his voice. Like, you know what I mean? Like, go do it. Like, I don't want to hear excuses. I don't want to hear you're afraid. Just do it. So I finally took the plunge and started doing it. But before I could do that, I had to have that conversation with my wife because even though I think real estate, a lot of the, the risks can be managed and, and you can take intelligent risks and educated risks, there's still risk, right? We were going to take some sort of risk. So I had to bring her along on this journey, which meant I had to get clear on what I wanted to do, how I was going to do it. And, and she's, a, she's a smart person. She's a master's degree. She's a teacher. Like she... She's not someone I can just kind of blow a little smoke and she won't figure it out. Like, no, she, she knows what she's talking about. So I had to present a, a coherent thought of how I was going to do this, why I wanted to do it and what I thought could be accomplished and how. And, and I did that. I, cre I created this like this argument or this, this elevator pitch basically for my, for my family. And, and I brought her along in the journey and she bought in and she was convinced because I had a a plan that made sense and it was well thought out and there was risk that was being addressed and how I was going to deal with it. And we did it. And, and from that point forward, it was like off to the races. And it got to the point where I started ramping up the business and it became a stress for her that she just didn't want in her life because she was still a full-time teacher. And so it's at one point in our business, she just took a step out of it and said, you do it. Like you can clearly handle this. This is causing me a little bit of stress that I don't need. I mean, we all watch these flipping shows, right? Things can go wrong and it becomes stressful. Um, I'm really good at managing stress and compartmentalizing things. So I could have, you know, my flip falling apart, but when it was time to sit down and hang out with the kids or like watch a movie, I can close the door for a couple of hours and enjoy the movie. And the next day, wake up and handle that again. Not everyone does that the same way. So uh, I took over the business. And once I took it over, I mean, you know, she handled a lot of the details. I'm not a detail person. She handled the details. And she also was a little bit of a, a checks and balance because I'm all gas. I have no brakes. And, and so she was sometimes the brakes like, hey, you know, we've got all this going on. We're kind of at capacity. What are you doing taking on more projects? Like we, we have all we can handle here, right? So she was that voice of reason. When she stepped out, it was very much like taking the governor off of a race car. Like I was all gas. And so the business did take off and I, I made more mistakes once she left. But ultimately, I, I also made a lot more money, right? So there was that trade-off and I, I was completely untethered and, and it just took off. And, you know, we, we'll get into it, but there was a lot of things along the way that allowed me to go from like trying to figure it out, making tons of mistakes, one man band into a company that was like fully formed, scaling up responsibly and scaling up fast, but responsibly. Yeah. Shocking that the uh, just start guy didn't, it was always all gas, no breaks. I love that. <laughs> always. Uh, yeah. The, um, so you talked, you touched on one thing there about that elevator pitch that you came up with to kind of, um, you know, went over your wife or that, you know, business partner, or whoever it might needs yeah. to be for newbies to be able to, to make that jump and just start. Um, how do you think about kind of forming that? Do you have any advice there for people? Yeah, I, I do actually. I really do. And it's different. I called it an elevator pitch because a lot of people in business, they, they get what an elevator pitch is, right? Right. And for people who don't know, if you're new to this and you're like, I don't know what an elevator pitch is. I mean, the basics of it is, the, the, the metaphor is you get in an elevator, somebody says, what does your company do or what do you do for a living? You need to have a clear answer for them that they understand before you get to their floor, right? So maybe you have 10 seconds or 15 seconds to just kind of spit out what your company is about so that they understand it before they get off, right? It's a little different when you're talking to your spouse, but the way that I, that I would suggest people go about this, and, and I'm glad that you mentioned this because this is something I'm really going to focus on this coming year, helping people because you know, the, the components of a successful business, some of the mechanics, the software that people can use, um, the software like that you represent, people have access to that and, and they don't necessarily need me to understand what tools will help them be successful. But where, where I see a problem and like, you're right, I've talked to hundreds and hundreds, perhaps thousands of you count my podcast of people who are trying to sort of get in the game or take that next step. And they struggle with, how do you come up with this elevator pitch for your friends, family, and loved ones to make them understand? 
And here's the process that I go through. So I'm trying to figure out how to, let's just use, uh, I'll use a wife just because it's in my world. So how do I bring my, my wife along on this thought? Because chances are, if you want to start a business or you want to take your business to another level, that's going to, it's going to cause you a little bit of like risk or whatever it is. Chances are you've been thinking about it for a while, right? And so you can't approach people with your, you know, 10 miles down the road thought process. You've got to, you've got to go back to the beginning where they are and bring them up to the point that you are. So they understand what you're talking about, understand your vision. So for me, it's about, okay, how am I going to learn whatever it is I want to get into? Let's just use real estate. I want to learn to be a real estate investor. I want to flip houses. I want to wholesale, whatever it is. How am I going to get the education I need? Because I'm a fan of education. Like I say, just start and I'm all gas and no break. And that's all true. I don't think you have to know everything from A to Z before you get started. I think that's the problem people have. But you have to know like A and B maybe. Like you have to have some concept of what is next, the next step is. So how are you going to get that information? Are you going to look for it and get it yourself? Or are you going to go to like a mastermind? And are you going to pay to be in a group of people and surround yourself with the right people that can shortcut your learning? So for me, if I'm going to talk to my wife and try to make her understand, I'm either going to show her or tell her where I'm going to get that education, even if it's free. If I need to join a mastermind, if that's what it is, I need to explain and expose her to that, what that is. So that's number one. I need to explain to them this guy who they've been married to for however long, who's never done anything in real estate. Why should I feel comfortable that you're going to take these risks in real estate? Well, it's because here's how I'm going to educate myself. This is the process of me becoming enough of an educated person in the space that, that I can take that risk. Now, once I decide how I'm going to educate myself, what assets do I have? Or what assets do we have if I'm talking to my wife? Um, maybe you don't have a lot of money to spend, but, but you have a lot of time, right? So, so my time in this case would be, would be, or my asset would be time. I, I, we don't have a lot of money, sweetheart, to spend on, on marketing or whatever, but I have time. And with time, here's what I learned from this group or from this education that I got here's how I learned I can use my time instead of having to use a lot of money. Now, maybe you have more money than you have time, right? I have a full-time job, I have kids and all these things, but I have a little bit of money. So how can I spend that asset in order to get me down the road and kind of mitigate some of the, some of the, the risks that we're going to be taking? And so you have to take uh, inventory of what you have to give. Now, I've talked to a lot of people who have no money and zero time. And I tell them, get one of those and come back. Because the reality is, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. And sometimes in, in all industries, but real estate is no, no exception, there will be someone who will tell you, you don't need time, you don't need money, you don't need credit, you don't need ambition, you don't have to get off the couch, you can watch all the TV you want. It's like, no, at some point, something has to be given. It's an exchange to the universe. Like, I want this thing. Here's what I have to offer. Mm. And, and, I, and I, I want that thing. So how do I get it, right? So time or money is important. If you have both time and money, then there's no excuse. Like you literally, you know, you should be able to get where you want to go. So you have to take inventory of your assets and what you have to give. And then the next step is, is the action, right? Just start. So my podcast is all about that. But the reality is people think of just start and they think of like, oh, just start my business. Like take the first steps. I, I think just start in, in the, and even forget just start. The concept of taking action is a daily thing, right? Just like you can't say, I'm going to brush my teeth today and then I'll be good for the rest of my life. I'll never have to do it again. No, you have to get up every day and brush your teeth or you're, you're not going to have teeth. So you have to get up every day and take action. Taking action is a daily mantra. It's a daily thing. You know, you know so fitness is important to me and I'm really trying to focus on it this year, getting in better shape and working out and all that. And one of my ahas in 2020, as I struggled with maintaining a workout schedule, is most people who achieve at a high level um, in, in athletics or in, in working out or whatever the people you see, I, most of them will tell you they hate working out. They don't necessarily, they would rather do something else, but they understand it's a means to an end. They have to work out. They figure out how to fit that in their day because having a healthy you know, body is more important to them than, than sitting around and doing nothing. So once I sort of got out of my head that everyone who works out and is in great shape loves working out, they like, can't wait, right? That's not necessarily true. Then I go, oh, okay, well, they're like me. It's not, I'm, not, I'm not dysfunctional because I don't like working out. It's just, I have to treat it like brushing my teeth, taking a shower, getting out of bed, like all of these things, I could find something else I'd rather do. 
but taking action every single day in your business or with your health or whatever it is, like that's the key. So when you're talking to your spouse and come up with an elevator pitch, like, why do I want to do this? And frankly, when I talk to my spouse about it, yeah, there were some analytics there. Like, how am I going to learn? What assets do we have? And how much are we going to be able to, to sacrifice or take risk with? But the other thing was, is if I don't do this, what does my life look like? What's my happiness level? Like, am I just miserable in my job? And I'm just, I feel like I'm just dying. Like who can relate to this? You look forward to Friday every single week. You love Friday nights. Saturdays are great, but you have a hard time enjoying Sunday afternoons because all you can think about is I have to get up on Monday and go do that thing that I do from Monday through Friday. And I don't like doing it. And so when uh, Sunday afternoons are ruined for me to some extent, Mondays and Tuesdays are horrible because it's the beginning of the week. And then I just start looking forward to the end of the week and rinse and repeat, right? Like, yeah, that's how a lot of people go through their life. But if that is what you are and, and you are inherently unhappy and your spouse cares about you, like that's a component. Like, I need to do this because I'm not happy. And, and here's what, how I thought through the risk that we will have to in, you know, incur. Even if it's not financial, at some point, I'm going to take the move to do this full time. And I want to have that conversation now so that I don't you know, shock you in a year or in six months or in three years when I decide to do this. Like, Bring them along on the whole journey. It's so much easier. A lot of guys and probably girls too, but I know guys do it because I know me is we go, I'm just going to do this and I'll just, I'll present it to her when it's completely ready to go, right? Like that, that's not a good idea. Like you need to bring them along. And I think that elevator pitch in the beginning, like how are you going to do it? What does it mean to you? What are the assets? What's the runway? By the way, when I, when I took that move to go from full-time job to full-time entrepreneur, the deal I struck with my wife was if I can put in the bank a whole year salary of my nine to five job, a whole year salary, and I don't touch it, and in eight months, if I haven't surpassed that uh, uh, regularly, like, like I can count on this money, within eight months, I'll go and look for a new job. It gives me four months to find a new job. We're in a very good market right now as far as jobs go. Is that okay? And she's like, yeah, you put your salary away and eight months from now, we have another conversation. Of course, right? She's not a risk taker. So I knew what kind of position I needed to put myself in in order for this to be okay with my marriage. And by the way, if you think you can just, I'm just going to plow ahead. I don't care what she or he thinks I'm doing it. Right. That's a, that's a recipe for disaster. At some point that's going to come to a head and you're going to have an uncomfortable conversation. And I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs who otherwise could be successful, but they can't get their spouse on board. They just can't do it. They're just, they're just saying no. Right. And whether you want to admit it or not in a healthy relationship, your spouse isn't on board. That's a deal breaker. That's tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you touched on a really important uh, part around the the idea of building good habits, like working out. Cause I mean, that's very much uh, a very similar meta metaphor that we use all the time is saying, Hey, if you're getting out there for us, it's driving for dollars. It's, it's building a, a routine, whether it's you or hiring a team to do it um, to get out there consistently and look for off market deals and look for distressed properties. Like that's something that requires the time or the money to do. And um, you know, a lot of times, especially for newbies, it'll be that hustle. It'll be the time piece. It'll be going out there and putting in those extra hours and doing it consistently because there isn't anything, like you said, that, that will, uh, you know, will, will get, get you rich quick when you have no time, no money, no anything, no value to yeah. bring to the table, right? So, yeah. Um, and if there's a plan there, by the way, and you've really worked out why this is so important that you do it, the consistency is key. You're right. And, and if you wake up and you just don't feel it that day, or you had a rough day, or maybe there was a setback, if you haven't come up with that why and that game plan and this whole, you know, this whole elevator pitch, you're going to struggle some days. Some days are easier than others. And the days that are hard, you're going to find a reason not to go out and, and, and take that action, or you're not going to get your reps that day. And that's the beginning of the end, especially for a new business. That's the beginning of the end is when you don't take action and you're not consistent. It's almost over at that point it, yeah. because success isn't about being a superstar. It's about swinging the bat. It's about taking your reps, like taking swings every single day. Like that, that's, the, that's the main ingredient. It's not genius. It's not being a rock star. You don't have to be Michael Jordan of real estate to be successful. You just have to go out there and, and just do it every single day. Yeah. And the why is what's going to drive you, like you said. Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. One thing you did touch on that I wanted to ask you about, you said, uh, you know, finding a mastermind or surrounding yourself with great people yep. um, to execute on that. I mean, 
I know you've talked about you have some uh, great mentors in your life. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about um, why that's so important? Why it's so important to surround yourself with great people, and then you know where newbies can start to find people that they should be surrounding themselves with. Yeah, totally. It's a game changer. I I'm telling you, I I bounced around for the first five or six years in real estate, and I wasn't I wasn't having the success that I thought I should be having. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them was in my world, in my bubble, in my surroundings of people that I surrounded myself with, there was just sort of a limited mindset. I, I you know, the, the, the investor that I knew in my market who was far and away the most successful, I mean, it wasn't even close. Everyone else was a distant second, did 26 deals in one year. And I thought, wow, if I could do half of that, like, oh my gosh. And that's what, that's where I set the bar. Like that's the most I thought was possible in a year. Like I didn't, I never heard of anybody doing more than that. And then I, I started my podcast and I started building my network outside of my little bubble in Southeast Michigan. And I, I came across somebody who was doing a hundred flips a year in Southern California. And I was like, first reaction, baloney. He is not, uh, got to know him personally. And I realized, oh boy, he is doing 100 deals. And here's the kicker. He's not that busy every single day. He has a lot of downtime. And the way that that happens is you create a business. And, and I like to, you know, sometimes people run their businesses like it's a lemonade stand at the end of their driveway, right? It's like, there's no process, there's no system. Like there's a different amount of sugar that goes in every batch. Like nobody's helping you. You're doing it all yourself. It's ridiculous. But if you run it like a business, it's it's possible to take yourself out. Even a business that's considered active, like flipping houses, right? It's an active business. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is active. It just doesn't you have to you doing the activity. So once I, I and then so that person who was doing 100 deals, his name was Justin Williams, good friend of mine. He he formed a mastermind, and I heard about it from him. He's my friend, and I'm like, okay, I know he's legit. I want to be in this mastermind because the 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 sales pitch for this mastermind was it's going to be all people who are in the process of scaling up their business. These are big thinkers, people who are already doing some deals. They kind of have some things figured out. We're gonna all collaborate and figure out how we can all rise ourselves up to the next level. And so I get in this room and it's just a bunch of action takers. Some of them were doing less than me. Some of them were doing more, but you know, there was one guy in the room in particular named Andy McFarland. Um, if you haven't heard of Andy, he's, he's probably the most consistently successful real estate investor I've ever met. And he's also consistently the best person I've ever been around just as a person. And, and I got exposed to him and the way he runs his company and his philosophies and how he's managed to scale. And at the time when I joined this group, Andy was about four years down the road. In other words, four years earlier, he was about where I was. And I said, listen, you've got this business that I admire quite a bit. I would love to have the same business you have. What did you do in the last four years? Like, what was the path that you took? Like, help help me understand the, the 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 blueprint of how you got from where I am to where you are, and the things that he shared with me after I heard him. And I can go through as much or as little of that as you want. But after I heard those things, I said, okay. So I hear you, and you told me the things you did right, and he also told me the things that he did that didn't work. And I said, if you learned all this over the course of four years organically, why can't I compress this into one year? Right? This is how I think I'm impatient. And I'm like, you just told me all the things you'd write wrong and you figured them out organically. Couldn't I do this in a year if I had like this hindsight that you have? And he's like, yeah, I don't see why not. And I'm like, done, done and done. Because I think it's critical for masterminds and surrounding yourself with the right people in general is, and I just sort of alluded to it, but I like to say you use their hindsight, successful individuals, use their hindsight as your foresight right? Can you imagine if everything you did in life, you did it with the knowledge of how it would work out if you did it any other way? Like that would be amazing. And so you surround yourself with people who are farther down that entrepreneurial journey, have businesses that you would love to have and deconstruct it. What did they do right? What did they do wrong? And use all of that hindsight to avoid the landmines that you're inevitably going to step on if you try to do it alone. And so for six years, I tried to build my company. And at the end of six years, I was doing a couple of deals a month. After I surrounded myself with the right people, joined the seven-figure flipping group is what, what I'm alluding to, I went from doing a deal or two a month to doing 10 to 12, and in some months, 15 or more deals a month, wow. purely by understanding 
how others had done it before me. I wasn't creative. I didn't innovate one single thing that year. Not one single thing that I do that I had not heard somebody else did and it was successful for them. But what I didn't do was make excuses. I didn't say, yeah, but that worked for you, but in my market, no, none of that. I said, Andy and a few other people, what did you do? Well, I did this. What do you think I should do? I think you should do this. Done. Mm -hmm. What's next? Done. What's next? Because I wanted to do it in a year. And I all I did was execute. I never asked why. Well, I asked why to the point that I understood how to do it. But I never said, yeah, but that won't work for me. I never second guessed them. I just did it. Mm -hmm. And it works, right? Just following the success of others and, and you reasonably will have similar success. Now, things work differently for me than it did for him. And I had to like maneuver, but I was basically just following his playbook. He wasn't doing anything outrageous. It's just, I didn't know about hiring. I didn't know about KPIs or metrics for my company. I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to create systems and processes. When I would go out and flip a house, I was recreating the process every time I was going to Home Depot and I was picking out tile as if I had never picked out tile before. Why? Why wasn't I using the same tile I did last time? I was overthinking it. I was trying to make it harder than it had to be. And business run well and run responsibly can be a little boring, right? So people, I don't know if they're trying to make it exciting or what, but a boring flip is more profitable almost always than an exciting flip. Because exciting implies things are happening you didn't predict. And if you didn't predict it, it's usually not financially good, right? So um, a, a flip going according to schedule and not having to yell at your contractor and not overspending, like that's boring, but that's where the profit is. And you need to get to the level of consistency and repeatability. And I knew nothing about any of those things. Yeah. And I think, I think real estate can be so overwhelming for people too, just because there are so many different avenues you can take that yeah. we try to approach that too, when it comes to at least lead generation using deal machine, like we try to teach people like, Hey, here's a playbook. Here's, you know, we want to simplify how you can think about finding your next deal or, you know, starting to, to, to get in touch with, with off-market property owners. Um, so, you know, a lot of what you're talking about there really speaks to how we think about things too. But um, yeah, I, I, I think when you're talking about, you know, you saying, Hey, I was doing a deal or two a month and I, you know, scale up, you know, quickly uh, from there. Um, there are a fair number of people who are listening to this right now that are thinking about that exact thing. They're, they're doing, you know, a deal or two a month and they're looking to take it to that next level. Yep. Um, do you, I know, obviously this is a, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways we could take it of, of areas that you think uh, it, people can really be helped, but what are maybe one or two areas that right away made the biggest impact for you that they can be different ways that shift their mindset into how to think through that playbook and how to, how to start taking it to that next level. Yeah. There, there, we, there were three things that helped me succeed and at, at, a, at a level that I was, you know, super excited about. One of them was joining a mastermind in, in surrounding us with people. We just covered that. Um, we alluded to a couple of the other things that I think are the real needle movers, right? There's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of roads we can go down. There's a lot of things that contribute in, in little ways that kind of make up the sum, but a couple of the big needle movers was hiring. My limiting belief before I surround myself with people who had hired and had this business they were running and not a lemonade stand. And I was running a lemonade stand, albeit a lemonade stand that made pretty good money, but it was still all me. I was on the hamster wheel, right? I, but my limiting belief was I can't hire because I'm not a big enough company to hire, but I can't get to be bigger if I don't hire because I'm already at capacity, right? So it's this catch-22 circular problem where I need to get bigger, can't get bigger without my, without people, can't hire people until I get bigger, right? So it was that limiting belief. And I learned it's very possible to build a team, right? Stop thinking of it in terms of hiring for a minute and think of it in terms of building a team. You might have a realtor on your team. You don't, you don't pay their salary, right? They help you find houses and they sell houses for you. That's a team member, right? You have a title company that's on your team. But there's also ways that you can hire people that doesn't break the bank. In my world, growing up as a you know blue collar mentality union, like I've got to pay someone 20 bucks an hour or I'm never going to be able to hire somebody. And that's not true. There are ways to bring people on and be a little more creative or a little bit more economical. One of them is VAs. Like people, I know people who run their entire highly successful real estate company on a v, the back of VAs that they're paying four, five, six, seven dollars an hour. And they're they're doing real good work for them. So that's an option, right? A part-time VA, someone to like take some of the admin stuff off your plate. And what I find is most entrepreneurs, most real estate investors are not great with details. They're big picture thinkers. They're like action takers and they're chess players and they're gamblers, but they're not great with some of the like really nitty gritty details. 
Well, that's what a lot of VAs are actually really, really great at is, is grinding through details that you're not great at. So bringing someone on 10, 20 hours a week at $6 an hour, like do the math. That's pretty inexpensive. It's pretty nothing, right? So that's one thing that people need to realize is, is most people need an admin, like almost they want. They need an admin, someone who can take on some of the grinding through the details so you can focus on what really matters. So I learned that. I also learned that hiring someone didn't have to be even a high level. Like I hired a rock star salesperson in my business very early on. And here's how I did it. And, and this is repeatable. This isn't a unique one-off thing. And I've told people this a, a lot is the person I, I hired a salesperson, by the way, the, because that was the part of my business that I was not the best at. Like I can do sales but I'm, I'm passable, like I'm adequate and I'm passable and, and insert any other mediocre term that you want. And that's what I am. And I am the owner of the company. So uh, I know that I need better than that. So I hired a salesperson. This guy worked as a pharmaceutical salesperson by day, nine to five job was a pharmaceutical sales. He was, he had a local on the road route that he, that he ran and he was killer. He was winning awards at their company. He was like, they were sending him to Hawaii because he was the top regional salesperson. Like he was a bona fide sales rock star. That's all he wanted to do was sell, sell, sell. And he was great at it. He, he got a hold of me. He found me, but I mean, you could easily search for these people, but he got a hold of me. We went out, we had lunch and he really was just picking my brain about real estate. He didn't necessarily want to work for me. He just wanted to, he wanted to pick my brain. So I did that. And when we were done, he sent me an email and he's like, Great conversation. Here's what I took away from it. Thank you for doing this. And by the way, if you're ever interested in hiring someone for sales part-time, I'd be interested in talking to you. So we started a conversation. Long story short, I hired him on commission base, right? So I didn't pay him unless we closed a deal. I hired him commission base to work for me. He was taking calls and going on appointments in between his normal day job appointments. By the way, his work still loved him. They were still giving him awards and giving him raises. They, they were ecstatic with him, but he was going on two or three appointments a day for me and answering all my calls. He didn't need my money. It was all commission, right? So I kind of got this salesperson essentially for free, or at least there's no overhead involved with it other than paying them when I get paid. And, and I was able to start scaling my business using him because he was so much better than me. If I went on 10 appointments, I would get one or two contracts on average. He goes on 10 appointments, he gets three or four, right? In real estate, where deals are 10, 20, 40, 60, $100,000, Doing an extra two or three deals a month with this guy, like, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean in your business? So, um, so that's how I did it. But I think that hiring component was a humongous hurdle in my brain that once I got past it, man, you can scale when you get the right people and you start building the right team. The other thing I did, I said, there's two things in addition to just surrounding yourself with the right people. The other thing was tracking numbers. You want to talk about the number one thing that will kill a business as they're scaling. It's not, it's not tracking your numbers. Most businesses fail because they just don't have a grasp on what's going on. In other words, they know money is going in and out of the bank, but they don't know how much, when, and why. So when I started tracking numbers, specifically marketing numbers, when I started paying attention to where am I spending money and, and on what kind of marketing is working and what isn't working because I'm tracking those numbers. So I'm spending you know, $5,000 a month on direct mail. I'm spending X amount on this, X amount on that. What's actually working? Like tracking those numbers at the end of the day and then pouring gasoline on the stuff that actually has a good ROI and maybe dialing back or eliminating the stuff that really doesn't work. It's amazing how many people don't know their numbers. Like somebody sends up postcards. What does it cost you to send a postcard? I don't know. Well, what is your average deal? I don't know. Like, how do you know if you're profitable? Like, I think I am. Like, I have money in the bank. You know what I mean? That's how people run their, their business sometimes, just on their bank account balance at the end of the month or end of the week. And I started tracking numbers. I, I started looking at what I call KPIs, right? Key performance indicators. What are my KPIs that matter? Like, how much money am I spending? How many calls is that generating? How many calls does it take to get an appointment? How many appointments does it take to get a deal? And what's my average deal, right? Once you have base, and that's, those are just base numbers. But once you have those base numbers, you can say, all right, I know my historical numbers. I want to make a million dollars this year. So let's work backward. Let's start with a million dollars. And how many appointments do I have to go on? How many calls have to make? How many money do I have to spend on marketing? You know, that's one way to do it. It's not the only way, but knowing your numbers so you can reverse engineer their success that you want. That's how I got to a million. Mm -hmm. I said, I want to make a million dollars. And I said, okay, what are my historical numbers? Good. So what do I have to do? That's what I have to do. 
right? And I and you can, it's a very blueprintable, if that's a word, there's a you can make a blueprint, but you can't make a blueprint unless you have your numbers. There's no way. I, I made five hundred thousand dollars last year. Good. Now I want you to get to one point two five. How are you going to do that? I don't know. Don't know my numbers. I have no idea how I got here, so I have no idea how I can ramp it up. But when you track numbers, you can do that. So that's all I really did. Surround myself with the right people. Started hiring efficiently and effectively, and I started um, knowing knowing my numbers, surrounding people, hiring efficiently, and surrounding with the right people. That that the far some people ask me like I wrote a book. Far and away, the three things that move the needle. 80% of the way, right? The other 20% were some of the other smaller things that, that I did that sort of helped along the way, like using software like Deal Machine, right? Like understanding some of the things and tools that I can insert into my business to take me to the next level. But far and away, those things were the three biggest needle movers in my, in my business and continue to be for that matter. Yeah, I can't emphasize enough knowing your numbers as well. I mean, that's really like, we actually recently revamped our dashboard within Deal Machine 2, where you go in there and the first thing you see are essentially what you're talking about, a reverse engineering that funnel, where you can say, yeah, if I want to hit, you know, 20,000, uh, you know, top line this month, and I know 10K is my average, you know, assignment fee or, you know, my average, you know, wholesale deal. Yep then here's how many leads I'm going to need to get in the door. Here's how many hours I'm going to need to drive to get to that many leads. Like it'll, we'll, we'll make recommendations for you for, for filling that, that pipeline with leads to get to those bottom numbers there. So yeah, uh, very, very similar. You can put that systematic approach there and know your numbers. Yep. That's when you can understand how to hire and, and, and how to scale and when to hire somebody and, and that type of thing. So yeah. you can't argue with data. And by the way, yeah. APIs are not just a marketing tool. Like mm -hmm. your people that you bring into your company you need to track the numbers that they need to be hitting too. The big mistake we made when we started hiring was we brought in a salesperson to supplement the, my sales guy, who, by the way, the sales guy became my partner, but to supplement him. But so here's what we did. People might hope this is a lesson learned. I'll be quick about it. But we brought him in and we had a ton of stuff in the pipeline, a ton of deals that were in the pipeline from my partner, who was, who, was, who was our sales guy. So we bring this guy in, he takes over the majority of sales. We're closing deals and we're like, we are on fire, we're rock stars. And then after about two or three months, the deal started going away and drying up and we had no more deals. And we're like, wait a minute, we were, what's happening? We're rocking and rolling. But what we really didn't realize was all of the deals that we were closing for the first 60 to 90 days were deals that were already in the pipeline. They were not new deals, but because money was coming in, we sort of got this, false sense of security until we realized our new sales guy had not closed a deal in like three months. We're like, wait a minute, we weren't even tracking it, right? So basic stuff like how many contracts are your salespeople getting on a weekly, maybe semi-weekly or monthly basis? Like you need, you need to know what your people are doing. And with people, I find it very effective to track activity. Tracking ultimate numbers is sometimes tricky and a little deceiving, right? I, if I tell my sales guy I need two deals a week from him, do I really care if he gets two every week or if he gets eight by the end of the month? Not really, not really. But if you don't track the weekly activity, it's hard to, you'll get to the end of the month and everything is like retroactive. Like everything else is like a, a trailing indicator, which is fine, but it doesn't really help you right at that moment. So we track activity, like how many appointments are you going on for the sales guy? I, I would rather they go on a lot of new appointments necessarily than track just contracts because contracts are also trailing, right? So I know intellectually, because I know my numbers, if my sales guy goes on eight appointments per week, reasonably, I know they should get two contracts, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so if great. they're not going on eight appointments, mm -hmm. I'm not going to see the contracts, but yeah. I won't know about the contracts until the end of the week or the end of the month. But on a daily basis, I know if they're going on appointments, right? So yeah. that's, the, that's the activity-based numbers that you have to track with your people. Yep. Understanding, like, like you said, activity based and that what is that top of the funnel where if you know the rest of the metrics and, and the rest of the conversion down the rest of that funnel, yep. you'll fill the top. And, 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 and if it's a systematic approach now and you have one or multiple people working on it, then, yep. then yeah, you can predictably uh, project out in the future like that. Totally. So, totally. Um, it's activity, man. It's just activity. Like data, when it comes to your marketing, it's, it's not as much activity. It's like, you know, I always say you can't argue with data. Like you can't argue with facts, right? Sometimes the facts are numbers based and they're like performance, but sometimes they're activity. And I think with people, activity data is so overlooked because everyone wants to end result. How many contracts do we get? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you didn't get a lot of contracts, but you can't do anything with that data if you don't understand the activity 
that leads to the result, right? And if you only manage results, you'll miss the activity part of it, right? You, you have to pay attention to activity too, because that really is the indicator of what the results will be at the end of the day. So all my people have activity-based goals. Yep. This is phenomenal, Mike. Yeah, I, I could ask you about <laughs> so many different facets of this for, for hours. So I really appreciate your time today. Um, do you have any other, I'd say any other kind of parting advice there of it, somebody who needs to just start, like where, where can they, you know, how yeah. can they be thinking about the right way? And then how do they get in touch with you? Like obviously your podcast, but yeah, please, uh, you know, plug away as well. Yeah, totally. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Well, first of all, if, if you want to find out more about how I scaled up in, in a little bit more of a comprehensive manner, you can go grab my book. It's called Level Jumping. You can go to Amazon. It's, it's there. Um, if you send me, if it's cool with you, if people um, mm -hmm. shoot me a text at the number 55444 and just text two words, text just start to 55444, I'll send you a free digital download of my book. So you don't even have to even buy it. Just send me the text and I'll send you a, a download. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as getting started, listen, that just start thing, I, I think sometimes it's, I, I said at the beginning, it's often misunderstood. Just start can mean, hey man, get off your butt, stop eating potato chips and watching, you know, Netflix all night. Like do something with the time when you get off work until you go to bed and your lunch hour and the weekends, like just start getting out there and taking the action consistently that will lead you to this company, this business that will help you get out of your nine to five. But it also means, listen, for that person who's listening, who's like, I've already started my business. Here's my problem. I need to scale it. I need to take it to the next level, right? Well, thinking about taking it to the next level isn't going to get you there. Just like thinking about starting in the first place didn't get you there. You had to take action. And maybe in the beginning, the action was obvious and now it's not obvious to you. If it's not obvious to you, what you need to do to go to the next level, then you need to surround yourself with the right people. And if you're listening to this and you're a real estate person, the seven figure flipping group, I'm going to say it. I'm just going to say it on camera. I'm going to say it on air. If I hadn't joined the mastermind, seven figure flipping, I a hundred percent know I would not be where I am right now. I a hundred percent know it. I couldn't have possibly done it without them because I needed, it's like anybody. It's like, if I just knew somebody who was super successful, who could just help me understand what steps I have to take, that's what this is. Right. And, you know, to that point, I'll make it really quick. Cause I know this is, this is a wrap up. So, some of my friends who are in that group that I've become very close to, they're the kind of people I want to be around. Andy, I mentioned him, great person. Bill Allen, you had him on this show. Yeah. Great person, right? So Bill reached out to me a couple of days ago and he's like, hey, we're going to go to, uh, I'm, I'm getting some people together. We're going to go to Disney. And I said, awesome. Sounds great. Who all are you inviting? And he starts naming people like Andy that I want to spend time with. And I told my wife, who's also been around these guys. And I said, hey, they invited us to go take a trip. What do you think? She's like, absolutely. Like we weren't planning on it and it's sort of at a busy time for us, but those are the people that I want to be around. Now, when we're out, are we going to talk about real estate? I, I'll bet we don't talk about real estate hardly at all. I'll bet. Cause we're going to be with our families and our wives and stuff. We may a little bit, but I want to surround myself with not only great business people who inspire me, but I also want to make it a habit to surround myself with people who inspire me as human beings. And if you can find people who inspire you as human beings and also inspire you as on a business level, hang on tight and don't let go. Those are the people you need to spend your time with because you will rise to the level of the people that you spend your time around. And unfortunately, a lot of times you'll sink to the level of the people that you spend your time around. So always try to spend time around people that inspire you in every way. And business is no exception. You surround yourself with those people, you will find good things happening to you. So that's my biggest advice. Agreed. Yeah. And like, like you said, we had Bill on, uh, you know, went to flip hacking live, like, you know, big fan of what everything that he's working on as well. So I can yep. you know, vouch for that too. But uh, Mike, thanks again so much for, for coming on here and uh, sharing your wisdom. Um, this was phenomenal. I'm um, excited to see this go live and uh, thanks again. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. I appreciate it.